The New York Negro Ballet came about, it was called Ballet Americana originally. Um, a young man named Ward Fleming wanted, to, he was studying with a bunch of people. He had studied on the West Coast where he, there was a company there with Joseph Rickard. Then he, the, comp, the people in New York were also studying and trying to put these little performing units together. And they used to perform around, uh, around the city. He decided he wanted a more serious permanent company. This woman, uh, Lucy Thorndike, a very wealthy woman from New England, sponsored him and paid for everything, costumes, dancers, musicians, because we had live music too. We traveled with live music. And um, it was a vehicle for him somewhat because he, he was uh, still dancing himself. And he got wonderful choreographers. And he, we stayed together long enough that he got a tour for Great Britain, and we were supposed to go on to Paris. Um, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but we had incredible costumes. We had marvelous uh, ballet masters. We had Michelle Delutri, we had Jack Carter, we had John Terrace. So we had quite an uh, impressive array of ballet masters working with us. Uh, the repertory was was kind of all over the place. We had, uh, we gave, we, <laughs> they gave new choreographers an opportunity. So, and we had Lewis Johnson's work. We were going to have uh, Anthony Tudor. <clears throat> I don't know what happened with that. When we got to Britain, they brought in Michelle Delutri, who at that time, he and his wife were very famous for their Bluebird. Potter, and he came in and put it on us, on Bernard Johnson and I. Uh, we had had a, a, originally another ballet master, Joseph Rickard. Ballet Americana, we were rehearsing originally in New York at George Chaffee's studios. Joseph Rickard was our original uh, ballet master. Oh, we started class at nine in the morning, and we usually finished around six. We had, we had a, a small break, and we rehearsed all day long. It was wonderful. I loved every minute of it. It was 22 dancers in the company at the time, so I just loved every minute of it. We had a small court of ballet, of course, because with 22 people, there weren't that enough. And we had almost equal men to women. Jean Sagan, Thelma Hill, Betty Ann Thompson, Ward Fleming, Sylvester Campbell, Bernard Johnson. I was a soloist. I got to do Bluebird, so that was wonderful for me. Well, we toured all of the Royal Opera Houses, which was quite spectacular because we did have live music. The halls were grand. Uh, unfortunately, when at the end of our tour, our sponsor died. Uh, she had not left any kind of uh, money or, or any kind of directions for us to continue in her will and her family wasn't interested. So we were instantly broke and had to come back home. And that pretty much was it. A Couple of people tried to put small units together and still did a couple of things, but the company never got together. And the reason we had forgotten, the reason we were called the New York Negro Ballet was because the British empresario wanted to make the audiences know what was coming. Uh, so they considered us exotic. <laughs> when we got to Britain, you, this is an amazing story. Um, we all, we, f well, first of all, we were so surprised at how well we were received by the British public population. We lived in a place where no people of color ever lived. We lived in Knightsbridge, and it was fine. Uh, we rehearsed down in, in Drury Lane Theater, and we would walk by in the morning, and, and all the vendors that had the wagons and things down at Covent Garden would say, oh, here come the ballet girls, you know. So that was a nun. It was really weird. They gave us uh, union cards, I mean, we were totally embraced. The whole staff, of course, was British, treated us amazing. I mean, I had never had, you know, I was 20 years old. I had never had anybody 
hold my sweater and everything. The stage manager <laughs> would make sure everything was fine in my dressing room. I had never had anybody do that before. It was quite, quite amazing. It was a very um, interesting experience because we were not treated like the other people of color in, in London at the time. Don't ask me why. I don't really know why. I don't know it was because we were Americans. I don't know what that was. But I know we didn't, I, out of the whole time, I remember one silly experience. Uh, one man said something to one of the dancers on the street and that he got put, put off pretty fast. And uh, that was the end of it. The audiences for our touring were wonderful. There, <laughs> there was a Girl Scout troop. We went to Leeds, uh, where else did we go? Uh, Glasgow, Edinburgh. A Girl Scout troop followed us for, for two towns and waited outside to get autographs. They fo followed us. Audiences were excellent. Uh, we stayed, at that time, performers stayed in rooming houses. Every place we stayed was wonderful. When I came back from Negro Ballet, I thought, I have all this experience and you know, uh, reviews and things, I'm, I'm definitely going to work. So I went to everything I could. I, I went to a ballet theater, did have auditions. Lucia Chase didn't even look at us. She decided not even to look our way. And then I kept hearing all these discouraging stories about people being passed over. So I had to eat, so I always had a job of some sort. But, it, you know, like I said, after a while, it just was heartbreaking. I just couldn't do it anymore. So I, I decided I'd be an office worker from that point on, which was one of the biggest mistakes in my life. I'm really sorry that I did that because I loved the ballet so much for my whole life that I was sorry I did that, and I was very glad to come back. I became a, a class taker ferociously trying to keep up my technique, but I became an office worker because I, I would go to auditions and there was nothing. Uh, it didn't matter, you know, resume, background, what didn't, didn't count. So after years of doing that, I just decided I can't do this anymore. And one day I was in, in a class at American Ballet Theater and one of the principals from New York City Ballet was in, it was Bill Dollar's class. And I used to demonstrate for Mr. Dollar. And she said to me, um, who are you working with now? And I said, I'm not working with anybody. She said, no, you don't. Understand. What company are you in? I said, I'm not in any company. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. I don't know what it was about that conversation or that remark. I left. I threw all my practice clothes away. I threw away my ballet slippers, all my point shoes. I said, I can't do this anymore. I just cannot, because I'm on the front line of a class with all the principals of New York City Ballet, and I'm the only one who's not working. I took auditions for some things. I took an audition once for a show. Barbara Wright and I happened to be, and we sat on the edge of the stage because the, the, the um, choreographer said, I can't match you all. So we, 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 we looked at and listened to the audition. And that was it, because we were ballet people. The Met Ballet audition I took because I had uh, worked for Tudor, and at that time he was the ballet master of the Met Ballet. That day was extraordinary. It's about 250 women showed up for the audition. I'd never taken an audition that long in my life. It was over six hours. We did, uh, we did jumps, we did turns, we did point work, we did bourrees. And we finished with 12 of us were left. And it broke my heart because one of the girls walked over to me from the ballet, Philadelphia Ballet Guild, Tudor's Ballet Guild, and she said, Dolores, I'm so glad you're here because Tudor promised me that the next time we auditioned and somebody was close to my height, he would take me in. And she said, he loves you, so I know I'm getting in. My heart fell in my shoes because it was Danila Markova work and Tudor who were picking and they were talking and talking and talking, and I knew it was, it was about nothing else other than how they were gonna tell me they weren't taking me. And so that's what happened. And I felt, so, you know, I felt it was horrible. I felt the responsibility. I have to feel bad for myself, 
But this poor girl thinks she's a shoe in because I'm here. So that was, that was the end of that. When I stopped dancing, I decided that I would not be crazy, that I would not be harmful to myself or to anybody else, uh, that I had made up my mind. I hadn't done it on the spare of the moment. I had made up my mind that my life was different, and I was going to deal with it on that level, that I had other life skills. And um, I had seen too many, uh, believe it or not, suicides, uh, friends from the company become alcoholics and die. Uh, one young woman who was from New York went up to her mother's house in Harlem and stepped off the roof, killed herself. And I said, I'm not going to do that to myself. There is a life. I do have other talents. And I'm just not going to destroy myself because I can't do this. And yeah, I loved it since I could remember, but I had sort of made my peace with it. Thank God there was a John Jones, and I could reverse that, and I could think of it in a different way. And if it wasn't going to be ballet, I danced with a wonderful person like Tally Beatty. I had a good friend, John Jones, wonderful dancer, grew up at Judamar School with me. He was in the Joffrey Ballet. He decided he was going to do a concert at the Lincoln Center Library Theater. He decided I was going to do it with him. I hadn't danced for three years. So he called me up and he said, girl, we're doing this concert. I said, no, I, I don't even have practice clothes. I haven't been in class in three years. He said, that's okay, we got six weeks. I said, six weeks? Oh my God, I haven't had point shoes on. I haven't had a turn. I haven't done, a, I mean, and I said, I didn't even go to class, nothing. He said, you'll be okay. So then he sick people on me. He sick Lewis on me. He sick John, he sick uh, Bernard Johnson on me. Well, anyway, the long and short of it was we went into rehearsal. Uh, we did some of Lewis's choreography. Uh, John choreographed some things and we had an evening. Uh, we, we did the performance, and there was a huge line out in front of the theater. They came to John. We were supposed to only do the one performance. They came to John and said, we have turned so many people away. You have got to do a second performance. So it was dark on Monday night, so we did. And then we got the review from Clyde Barnes that was just wonderful. And I said, you know, I don't care if I get a job in these major companies. I'm not going to stop doing what I love to do. From that point on, then I started working with Tally Beatty. I started teaching. And I never again worked in an office. It was interesting. I replaced the, the office with, with teaching jobs. And then Tally came along. And then I went to work for Tally Beatty's company. But in the interim, I also got a wonderful experience. I did an audition for Alvin Ailey for Balanchine. He choreographed a, a pas de cisse, and I was one of the women uh, in, in, it was on point for Balanchine. And like I said, from that point, then I was back. Ballet has, has really, really, really been, um, the, as far as the opportunities in ballet, I shouldn't say ballet, ballet never disappoints me. Uh, I still love it as much as the very first day, uh, first performance I ever got to see, which was uh, Margot Fontaine at the Academy of Music in the Rosa Dodge. I will never forget that my whole life. So ballet doesn't disappoint me. What's disappointed me is that there's been no step forward. And I, when I say no, I mean none forward in the major companies. And shame on us. Because audiences, I, I learned way back in 1956 with British audiences, they don't care as long as you do what you do well. That's what they care. They bought a ticket, you do it well, they don't have a problem with you. I do not understand, since we have been seriously in ballet since the early 30s, and there's documented proof of that, two of the original students at School of American Ballet were Betty Nichols and Tally Beatty in 1939 at School of American Ballet, invited by Mr. Balanchine. 
I don't understand from 1939 to today why there is such a small representation of people of color. And I'm not talking only about black people. I'm talking about Asian and Spanish and all people of color. I don't, I don't get it because on the stage, the only thing that counts is you doing your job, not the color you are doing it. I don't know how many people are in New York City ballet now or ballet theater. You can't have 10 girls in the core. You know, you got Asian girls studying in the school. You got black girls studying in the school. You got Spanish. Why, why are they not in the court of ballet? You mean you're not training them well enough? You thought they were talented when they auditioned for the school, but they're not talented enough to go in the court of ballet? I was invited to a number of years ago um, as a fundraiser to, to go observe class at School of American Ballet. So it wasn't that long ago because they were repairing the school. And I'm seeing these Asian kids, and I'm seeing black kids in the classes, and I'm thinking, what happened to you later on a couple of years from now? They were about 14, 15 years old. You mean none of them are good enough? And then don't defend it by saying we've got three boys in the course. So what? So what? As far as diversity in the classical company, somebody needs to just do it. We don't need a meeting. We don't need a search party. I call it a search party because you have a meeting so we can research diverse. No, come on. You know, if, if I was at, at, at New York City Ballet, I walk across the quad to Juilliard. You're going to tell me I can't find 10 girls in ballet? I go down the block to 55th Street and the Alley School. I know they're in there. I've seen them. Across this whole of America, you can't find 10 or 12 girls. You don't want to. And I feel very strongly about it. How did, how did Ballet Americana that became New York Negro Ballet happen? Because Ward Fleming decided it was happening. And he knew there were enough good ballet dancers that he could make it happen. That's all. It's just the will to do it. The burden ought to be, why can't our imagination take us to, I can do Giselle. I did Bluebird. They didn't boo me off the stage. When Bernard and I came on, we got wonderful response. Nobody ran screaming out of the theater like, oh my God, what are those people doing? You know, it's just bogus. I'm going to flat out, flat out want that on the record. It's bogus. You do not have to meet. You don't have to research it. It's dance. It's clear. It's straightforward. You go to class. You either can or you cannot. And it's the will of the people who are choosing. Somebody was saying to me, and I don't even know if this is a fact, that the only reason that people are not in those two companies specifically because the board doesn't want it. Okay, if that's the truth, then I want to see the names published of the board people. I want to know who those people are. I know who's directing the companies, but I, I think don't hide behind being on the board of. I want to see those names. Is, is that who you really are? Is that what you think of 2017 America? And I will not fund it. I will not sponsor it. I don't go anymore. I, I, I go to the ballet now when I go abroad or when a foreign company comes here. And I'm sorry because New York City Ballet was my first school and I loved the repertoire. <coughs> I was a huge fan, but you know, that's not a big burden on me not to see them. Because until they fix their act, I'm never going to see them again. I've had a point where I wanted to talk to everybody. I had a point where I didn't want to talk to anybody. I had a point where I was so fed up with everybody and repeating the same stories. But I realized that there are so few of us left alive who've witnessed this history. We don't talk we, in abstracts. We talk in fact. You know, I can tell you about an audition. I was there. I was a part of it. I can tell you about friends' experience. When we're gone, there won't be anybody to talk about that because even more current-day people who are wonderful dancers, who have amazing careers, people don't know who they are. And that, as long as I can lend my voice to keep that alive, as long as I can still speak and talk about it. I change my mind about resisting it. 
And I will go probably go backwards again and say, I don't want to talk to anybody. Uh, you know, it's boring. I, you know, forget you. But, you know, maybe I'm still here with my head halfway on straight for that reason. Because when I hear young dancers not know who we were, and when we all knew who the dancers who came before us were, I guess as long as I have some kind of voice. And also, I feel like I can relate to the young dancers with what they're doing, because I've done it too. You know, I, I've, I've been that dancer. I've stood in the middle of a stage and been that person. And I, I'm very happy that I was able to do that. Uh, our company didn't last long, but we're on the boards, we're on the records, we're part of history. So I'm glad to be part of that. And like I said, I, I may be, you know, down the road, I may get annoyed again and say, I don't want to talk to anybody. But right now, I think what, what kind of drew me up short was another friend dying. And it's just too scary. The voices are gone. And they're the people who remember the history and remember the dates and remember the people. Um, when we're gone, like, who's going to... Who's going to talk about it? Who's going to remind? I also want people to understand, particularly ethnic people of every stripe, when you step into the ballet world, you belong there. You are not visiting. You belong there. I don't want people to feel like, because I've had it said to me recently, you know, they don't want to see, no, 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 no. It has nothing to do with anybody saying they, who are, who are that great they. I don't know who they are. You belong where you think you belong. You work your hiney off to, to get that ability and technique, and God gave you the gift, you belong there.